Uh, guys, I'm actually going to use the mic because uh, I kind of lost my voice partying too much this week. No, just kidding. I, um, I, I, uh, I'll use the mic because it'll be easier to project to the back row. Um, I was kind of depending on Andy's presentation to introduce the topic of heterogeneous networks and small cells. Um, now, now that we're not having that presentation, I'll spend a bit of time kind of explaining what I mean by a het net. I think a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of service providers around the world are, are talking about uh, how do we actually provide more capacity to the end user uh, using mobile broadband. And the real, the real problem has been so far has been, has been a spectrum issue, right? How do we actually deliver more services with the limited amount of resources that we have in, in, in mobile broadband spectrum? Uh, but there's different techniques that are being put in place to provide infill or capacity infill. So you've heard about different sort of techniques like Wi-Fi offload, for example. Uh, femto cells, pico cells, micro cells being deployed to provide infill in hotspot areas where there's more demand than supply for broadband. And so, really, what <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you about today is 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 more on the on the backhaul side of the equation, because you have on the on the one side you have the ability to provide this bandwidth at the edge, and you have a number of technologies and techniques to do that. But on the flip side of the equation is. Um, if your pipe to those cells remains narrow, right, and you're not providing enough capacity to the edge, you're going to have bottlenecks back to your core. And uh, this is a problem that we're identifying in, 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 a lot, uh, in a large part of Central and Eastern Europe, but also in emerging markets, and uh, again, also in, in North America, especially in not just dense urban areas and metropoles, but also in increasingly what you're going to find in, in rural, what I call rural urban areas. Right, so they're not necessarily New York or, or, or Los Angeles, but they are uh, urban environments in rural locations. And, and there's, a, there's a backhaul problem there as well. So <clears throat> that's what I'm going to be discussing first. And I think after that, given the uh, rejuggling of the schedule, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about something I discussed last year, uh, which was the MTVDS solution that we've developed with Globecom. Um, but more bringing it into reality because there's been a lot of progress since I last spoke to you about this solution. And, and we were actually deploying it in practice in, in East Africa. And I think it'll be interesting for some people to see how that's translating into reality from what we were discussing last week. But that'll be uh, a second presentation. So I think you're stuck with me for at least a good hour. Sorry about that. OK. Um, just really quickly, um, you know, we are, we are a network equipment manufacturer uh, based out of the UK in London. Uh, what we do is uh, enable convergent operators, i.e. fixed and mobile operators, to deliver uh, very high bandwidth to their end users, right? And, and we do that through a number of solutions, uh, mostly in, in, in the backhaul space as well as the fixed wireless access space. Uh, we are... Um, we released a backhaul solution this year at Mobile World Congress, uh, and we now have about eight trials going on in 2012 since the launch of this solution. Uh, it's just, uh, okay. So I think this is, you know, every vendor needs to have a slide on network convergence and applications and hockey stick curves and, and everything. So I'm going to spare you the, 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 the whole, the whole explanation on, on, on data demand and growth. I think we all, we all know what's going on here. I think what's really interesting, though, is the applications that we're seeing. We've spoken about M to M, machine to machine, this morning. And I think what we're seeing is uh, the bandwidth needs are going everywhere. I mean, whether you're talking about video surveillance, whether you're talking about uh, mobile banking, smart grids, telemedicine, in, in parts of East Africa, teleeducation, like how do you get um, advanced learning services out to rural villages, for example. Um, so I think it's, it's safe to say that more and more devices are getting connected, more and more devices are taxing into the bandwidth pool, and this is not happening just at a regional level, it's happening at a global level with interconnected devices. So what we're seeing is different projections, you've got Cisco's VNI index, you've got Ericsson's 50 billion devices connected number. I think that uh, one of the, the key things is the, the, the applications are causing a convergence between fixed and mobile networks. And 
what we're seeing is a reality in the network where it's no longer just about a radio access network or a BTS station. It's about uh, a fixed wireless access point, a Wi-Fi access point, um, a enterprise link, all being uh, delivered within a service provider's network. And they're having to manage not just wireline or wireless technologies, they have to manage IP services that are running off mobile broadband or fixed broadband services. And so they need to plan for the consumption of, service, of these services regardless of the technological backbone that's being served to deliver these, these applications. And um, this, is, this is requiring service providers to kind of challenge everything, kind of challenge some of the basic assumptions. I think one of the, one of the things that we can say about mobile is, despite, despite this, you know, when we were living through this, it didn't seem that easy. But if you look back, the transition between 2G and 3G services was relatively painless. Um, you know, there, from a backhaul perspective, it wasn't that hard. You know, you initially 2G and 3G cell sites could co-locate, you know, leverage the same sort of T1, sorry, E1 or T1 uh, circuits. Um, the existing backhaul was sufficient. Uh, and, uh, and the devices were, you know, 2G, 3G compatible. It wasn't, it wasn't too much of a nightmare. However, uh, with the introduction of, of later revisions of, of 3G, HSPA notably, that kind of started pushing the limits of what was available in the infrastructure. Um, and and something, that, something started to emerge where customer experience, right, on, on the delivery of mobile broadband started to become an issue because suddenly you started having to share a lot of limited resources between an increasing number of users. At the same time as HSPA was being rolled out, we were starting to see the advent of smarter devices being rolled out in the network. So the iPhone, iPad, um, Android smartphones, the emergence of more and more M2M applications. And, and suddenly, customer experience was an issue. And you, start, you started to have to think about, oh, we need to start rolling out more bandwidth to our users. So the industry kind of went, OK, well, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to need more spectrum. Well, more spectrum is not that easy, as we found out, right? And that's taken time, and it's still taking time for a number of regulators worldwide to allocate LTE spectrum, refarm broad, broadcast spectrum uh, to mobile broadband spectrum. But there's been different techniques in the meantime to kind of manage that, right? So we introduced Wi-Fi to offload networks and desaturate the, uh, the cellular network. Um, and you start looking at introducing smaller cells or small cells um, to infill hotspots. So areas where there is uh, a lot more traffic than your network can provide for, your macro base stations can provide for, what you do is you roll out pico cells or smaller cells that are powered down and have a smaller cell range, which means that as you have a smaller cell range, you have less users occupying that cell range. And because you have less users, you're dividing the capacity by a lower common denominator, which means there's more capacity per user. But there's an implication to that. And um, this, is a, this is a chart that kind of, this is from Heavy Reading, um, the analyst group. And Heavy Reading did a survey across uh, about 19 operators. Uh, across the globe in terms of the expectations of the ratio between microcells and macro base stations. Now the key point here is if you look at today, more or less uh, operators are looking or forecasting at one to, two, one to three microsites to a macro base station. So is not that much, okay? But by 2015, you can see that basically more than 50% of operators are expecting at least four to six cells per macro site, if not 10. In fact, in the United States, they're expecting more than 10. A lot of the operators here are, are expecting more than 10 micro sites per macro base station. That has some pretty heavy implications because that means you're looking at a network densification that could be going up to 10x what, what you see today in terms of cellular sites. So the topology is evolving. And I think the key point about this is that densification, or network densification as I like to call it, is table stake. It, it's going to happen. Whether it's happening with cellular, you know, small cells, or whether it's happening with Wi-Fi access points, or an integration of both, right, that's what's going to happen in the next couple of years. So, whereas you may have 100 cell sites in a given area today, you could end up with 400 to 500 heterogeneous cells in that same coverage area in the next five years.
And then the key question becomes, are we, are we ready for that? Are we ready to basically provide those from a regulatory perspective? Are we able to get the rights, the site rights, to install the dishes that we need to, or the antennas that we need? <clears throat> the industry, I think, believes it's prepared. Uh, they, they, they have different technologies. I mean, we have different technologies in the room today uh, that look at you know, indoor base stations, indoor coverage, small cell coverage on a lamppost, uh, various backhaul techniques. But um, you know, are we really prepared? And, and you know, we, we, we have to kind of think about what we don't know yet. And that's, that's the key thing. We always kind of look at things in terms of, oh, current demand is 100 megabits per cell site, or current demand is 400 megabits per cell site. Um, but we have to start looking at the applications that are coming our way. We spoke about some of the stuff like the teleappliances, telematics, and all this stuff. That's not so much what I'm worried about. What I'm worried about is things like voice over LTE, right, which hasn't really rolled out yet. It's in trials. But when we start moving voice over to the LTE network and start uh, handing over all of the voice communications to an IP network, suddenly the quality of service and the availability of your mobile broadband connection becomes even more important. Even though voice is no longer a revenue engine for operators, it's still a table stakes service that you need to offer as a converged provider to your end customer. And if you don't have the same uh, sustained quality of service for your voice networks, you're going to have a lot of churn. Um, and that's, that's one of the key things that we need to look at is, in a recent survey performed by, by Nokia Siemens Networks, um, they looked at, they looked at um, usage patterns for, for mobile broadband. And they saw that around 40% of mobile broadband users, advanced mobile broadband users, were likely to churn because of quality of service issues or customer experience issues on their mobile broadband service. That doesn't mean that 40% of all customers are likely to churn, but those that are using advanced high ARPU services are likely to churn. So delivering a high QoS system or a high QoS service is key. Now, another thing that kind of scares me is how does on-demand video affect the customer experience? When you've got more and more people pulling data off YouTube or uploading stuff from their devices, simultaneously, and this is going to happen as we roll out more and more or adopt more and more smart devices, um, there's going to be a lot of contention for bandwidth. And networks are already heavily contended, and operators are already putting in place commercial techniques to try and stifle that, that, that demand, right, by tiered data usage pricing, um, limits on, on, on data per month, caps, basically controlling supply Right? Controlling supply by, by controlling price. Um, the third thing that, that I think is something to worry about is mobile cloud computing. Uh, currently, I think more and more people are starting to use mobile cloud computing applications. I mean, I'm a big fan of Dropbox. I keep a lot of my stuff on Dropbox because I can then show a presentation off my iPhone to somebody when I'm on the road. And it's great because I always have my data sheets and all that stuff and it's, it's amazing. However, I get really pissed off when I'm at a conference and the cellular network is overloaded, the Wi-Fi network is overloaded, and I can't access my Dropbox, and I want to give a presentation, and I can't, because it's in the cloud, and I'm not connected to the cloud. Right? And so device and network dependency is increasing, whether it's Google applications, whether it's your Salesforce.com application as a sales guy, or Dropbox for any usage we're having more and more addiction to the cloud. So not having access to it is likely to affect that churn indicator, okay? So when I look at all of this, it's clear to me that the quality of experience that we're gonna deliver in mobile broadband is gonna be key, right? Now, small cells is one way to do that because as I said before, you roll out smaller cells in high usage areas that are shared by less people, therefore more megabits per user. And more megabits per user means that you can basically plan right, for peak provisioning right, and provide good, adequate you know, bandwidth that matches your LTE rollout or your advanced 3G rollout, and you're not having bottleneck in the middle mile. So in order to be looking after that quality of experience, I kind of break it down into to three categories. Right? You need to be able to provide backhaul 
that has sufficient levels of coverage in those areas, in the dense hot spot areas, you need to provide enough capacity and you need to be really, really conscious about cost because we're talking about a lot of cells, right? If you're talking about a cell range of around 300, 400 meters, right, or 300 meters, every 300 meters you're going to be having a small cell either off the uh, side of a building or hooked up to a lamppost. That's a lot of cells that you need to back home if you don't have a price point or a cost point that is proportionately only, only, only a part of the cost of the cell, you're not going to have a business case that stacks, right? So you're not going to be able to backhaul. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the options that you have for backhauling a bit later. The other thing, okay, so in terms of, in terms of coverage, it's really important that you cover um, as much of an area as possible when you're backhauling. Um, you need to be able to have a wide area coverage and, and be able to minimize the overcrowding of equipment on towers. Um, in Paris, where I come from, uh, it's really, really hard to obtain site acquisition rights to install new dishes. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, the city of Paris is really conscientious about visual urban pollution. Okay? That might not be the case everywhere. I think um, India is a bit more lax about that. But, and Sao Paulo is a bit more lax. But there's a lot of places where you can't just be putting up dishes willy-nilly. Okay? And in fact, if you look at small cells and how they are deployed today, a lot of them are camouflaged into the urban environment. The, uh, the Olympics in London is an interesting anecdote, right? They introduced about two to 3,000 small cells in central London before the Olympics. And uh, you can play a game. You can walk around Regent Street or Buckingham Palace, and you can actually go look for the small cells because they're really hard to find. They're actually really well camouflaged into lampposts and into the urban environment. You can't actually tell they're there. Right? And there's a reason for that, because there's a ton of them. And you don't want all these white dishes everywhere. <clears throat> you also need to be able to extend that range of, of, your, of your coverage. I mean, there, you don't know when your next hotspot is going to arrive. So you need a solution, you need to put in place a solution that allows you to easily extend the coverage without having to do any major infrastructure work or negotiation with councils on, on, uh, on, on site rights. Capacity. Capacity is uh, one of the key issues. You need to basically, I think there's, a, there's an attitude in the industry of, okay, you know what, the only way we can provide capacity is deploying fiber, right? Like future-proof capacity is by providing fiber to the cell or fiber to the base station, and this is the only way we're going to guarantee the future-proofness of our investment. Uh, the only problem with that is that that kind of impacts the coverage side of the equation. How quickly can you deploy that fiber and how does it affect your time to market? Do you have way leaves? You know, do you have access rights? Do you have access to the ducts? I mean, it's a whole bunch of issues for non-incumbent operators, right? Uh, the, the other thing is, you know, scaling your capacity as demand grows. You may not need to provide 400 megabits to the cell site on day one, but you may need to do that day after tomorrow or the, the year after. How do you do that without re-intervening on the site? Right? That's, that's a key point. How do you progressively scale the endpoint to deliver the bandwidth it needs as it starts using more and more bandwidth. Finally, the way I look at it is, you know, think big. Just start delivering on, an, on a coverage area 10 times the capacity that you need today. Because guaranteed, with the way the hockey stick curves are growing on, 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 on demand, you're going to need that capacity within five years, right? So how do you do that without, again, digging up all your roads? That's, that's one, one aspect that, that is key. Finally, cost. Um, one of the key problems about small cell and their execution is cost of ownership. I mean, I think everyone agrees that smaller cells is going to help um, uh, provide a higher quality of service. I think the biggest challenge is how do you deploy them without breaking the bank for ISPs? And there is so much cost uh, going into this, not just the capex cost of the equipment, but the opex cost related to um, site rental costs. Uh, in, in, in some parts of you know, central London, for example, where I live, uh, the cost to put a 30 centimeter dish uh, on a building can be 1,500 to 2,000 pounds, about $3,000 per year. Now that's just one dish, no big deal. But again, when you've got a dish every 300 meters, that's going to add up. And on the backhaul, and that's just the edge. If you want to start talking about the backhaul, if you're looking at point-to-point -point microwave, for example, well, you know, if you've got 100 cell sites, that's 200 pieces of kit. 200 times 3,000 per year over five years costs a lot of money. And that's within a one kilometer radius. So 
cost of ownership is key. You need a solution that's not only CapEx efficient, but also looks at the operational expenditure per year, the O&M costs. So if you look at some of the options that are out there, <clears throat> I talked about fiber earlier. And I think <laughs> there's no way that we're going to dispute that fiber isn't the ideal backhaul solution. I think it is. Um, it's got some pretty good capacity, um, some pretty good performance in terms of latency. But the problem is penetration. Now, I know that in the US, dark fiber penetration is a lot higher than anywhere else in the world. Well, anywhere else in Europe, for example. South Korea accepted, <laughs> right? Uh, but the problem is that you know, when we're talking about not just the major urban areas, but the rural urban areas, it's not necessarily 50%. It's more along the lines of 20 to 30%. And um, typically, it's pure urban as opposed to suburban. And there's issues over trenching and way leaves. If you're not an incumbent carrier, you're going to have to spend quite a lot of time, well, even as an incumbent carrier, by the way, spend a lot of time negotiating with councils, municipalities, um, city, city councils to get the rights to deploy your fiber to the right locations. And when you're talking about planning for hotspots, time to market is an issue, right? So if you have to wait six months to one year before you get council approval to roll out your new fiber network, well, you might have missed a market opportunity. People will have moved on. Your competition may have moved on. So you need options that are going to accelerate your TTM. And you know, if you can't get up there as quickly as possible, that's going to impact your bottom line, plain and simple. So then, you know, that's when microwave comes into place. So you know, point-to-point -point microwave, which is a ubiquitous form of providing backhaul, right? Uh, came about because it was a way to substitute itself to fiber deployments to quickly put together bandwidth to a cell site. Now, I think point-to-point -point microwave was definitely ideal in the 2G, 3G world where you, know, you could deliver 100 megabits per second. Uh, nowadays, you've got software upgrades to 200 meg, even sometimes 400 megabits. And, and it's, good, it's, 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 it's pretty good bandwidth at a very good capex. I mean, there's no doubt that point-to-point -point microwave costs per link have gone down dramatically over the last five, six years. There's been a lot of competition. You know, uh, Ericsson's deployed you know, over millions of links using the Minilink product. That brings the cost of you know, production down. So there's a lot of advantages to putting point-to-point -point microwave out there. One of the things that we find is a bit challenging, though, is, is in a dense urban environment, when you have hundreds of cells to deploy within a one kilometer range, or thousands of cells, well, you're not going to be putting point-to-point -point links all over town. You know, there's only so much space you have on towers. There's only so much space you can get on sites. And you know, it's, going to be a it's going to create a lot of, of uh, visual pollution as well. So there's a challenge there, which is open up opportunities for other types of solutions to come into play right? for small cell backhaul. Um, one of the things that, that um, just going back to the capacity issue, one of the things that's been challenging about point-to-point -point microwave is that you know, in the zero to, you know, in the six to 38 gigahertz, which were typically point-to-point -point microwave has been functioning, the, the amount of spectrum you have available or the channel sizes are a bit limited, right? So in terms of growing capacity to a site, if you wanted to go beyond 400 meg or behind, beyond 200 meg and start delivering wireless gigabit, right, to a major site or something like that, you couldn't really do that. So, Point to points evolved to introduce millimeter waves. So you've heard about 60 gig, 70 gig, 80 gig products from various vendors that'll essentially provide massive amounts of bandwidth to an endpoint, right? So gigabit capacity, uh, and you know, from 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 the hub location to the endpoint, which is great if you're talking about enterprise. It's great if you're talking about providing uh, some sort of an aggregation node in your backhaul network where you can extend the reach of the fiber to a place where fiber isn't there, and then you know, create another hub with a gigabit link. Um, the thing is, it, it still doesn't address some of the OPEX stuff that I was talking about earlier about site rentals and the number of sites you need to install these uh, pieces of equipment on. Okay? So in, in, parts of, uh, in parts of the world, um, various uh, operators started deploying points and multi-point microwave. Now, this wasn't especially popular in North America, to be honest, right? Uh, but it had a lot of, uh, a lot of um, success in the Middle East and in large parts of Africa. Why? Well, because it was a really good way for these nations to accelerate their time to market to roll out 2G and basic 3G services. 
basically to provide backhaul to an increasing number of cell sites rapidly, they put in a single hub radio, opened up a sector, and then backhauled five to six sites with the, the bandwidth required to roll out 2G and 3G services. So you know, typically two to 10 megabits per second on a site. Not a lot of bandwidth, but enough to roll out two, two and a half G services. But the problem is that when it comes to a 4G world, or when it starts coming to you know, HSPA, you, know, you need at least 100 megabits per second to start off with. That's the bare minimum at this point in time. Current point to multi point technology can't afford that. It doesn't have enough spectrum, there's not enough capacity, and the radios are limited to 28 megahertz, maximum 56 megahertz channels. So they're not going to generate more than 150 megabits per second on a sector. That's barely enough to cover more than one site, right, in a 4G world. So that's a problem. So much in the same way as point to point had to evolve to point to, to, to millimeter wave. Uh, point to multipoint microwave has to also evolve to leverage the, the capacity available in millimeter wave frequencies. Because if you can increase the amount of contiguous spectrum that you have, then you can increase the amount of bandwidth you deliver on a sector, and suddenly point to multipoint becomes relevant again. So that's, intru that's introducing point to multipoint millimeter wave, which we see as a second generation PMP platform that leverages the three gigahertz of contiguous spectrum in the 42 gig Q band, right? So that's 40.5 to 43.5 gigahertz. That's an ITU normalized frequency where there's three gigahertz of contiguous spectrum. That's 3,000 megahertz. If you think about the existing PMP platforms, there's only about 56 megahertz available in some of these frequencies in the legacy technologies. Now we're talking about 3,000 available. So. You know, then you start leveraging these, these large blocks of contiguous spectrum, use a one gigahertz wide radio, and then provide scalable two gigabits bandwidth on a sector. Now, two gigabits on a sector could allow you to backhaul 20 sites at 100 meg, or 10 sites at 200 meg, or five sites at 400 meg. It's not the same thing as a point-to-point -point millimeter wa wave link that'll deliver one gig to a point, right? But you can easily deploy 100, 200, 400 megabit configurations endpoints from a single radio hub. So that basically means that if you were trying to deploy 10 sites at 200 meg, rather than having 20 pieces of equipment with 200 megabits per link, you would have 11 pieces of equipment delivering 200 megabits per link. So the capex cost is obviously much reduced. The opex cost becomes reduced because you have less equipment on towers. You have smaller installation teams because once you've created your sector of coverage, you only need a, a, a single team at the endpoint installing versus two teams trying to communicate and make the link work. So the O&M costs go down as well. So the key point here is being able to de deliver peak performance point-to-point -point capacity, but using a point-to-multipoint architecture for the cost efficiencies. So this is an example of uh, a legacy point-to-multipoint solution where essentially, at, at best, uh, which one is the laser, the laser? So at best, you know, you, you're going to be looking at 290 megabits per second using the highest modulation possible, 256 qualm, at a range of 1.2 kilometers, which is what your range would be in a dense urban environment. You wouldn't want to spread your, your bandwidth further than that. That's 290 megabits per second, really about two, maximum three cell sites at 100 meg. <coughs> If you look at next generation PMP, what you're doing is 2,300 megabits per second, so 2.3 gig at 64 qualm, 600 meters. If you want to push it up to 1.35 kilometers, you got one and a half gig. And then at 2.8 kilometers, about 800 megabits per second. So we're talking about, on average, about 10 times more capacity than existing systems. Now, it's important that the solution is all IP. I mean, in a mobile broadband world, we need to start talking about you know, data optimized networks. We, we look at it as well and say, you know, there's a lot of waste happening in terms of the, uh, the architecture that's being deployed. If you're looking at deploying FDD type networks, then essentially you're forcing symmetry on the usage. Um, and the fact of the matter is, consumption is asymmetric. It may be asymmetric privileging download or privileging upload. You may have situations where in a stadium scenario or the Olympics, for example, 
you want to be privileging upload versus download because you've got a, you know, hundreds of thousands of users trying to upload pictures, upload videos versus download stuff because they're already there. They're the event, right? Same thing, you know, where you're looking at, at, um, at other types of scenarios where it's typically 75, 25, or 80, 20. It's rarely 50, 50 unless you're talking about enterprise. So what we decided was, you know, let's take a look at TDD because in that case, what you can do is allow an operator to define how much bandwidth they want to allocate on the downstream versus the upstream. And if they want to make it 50-50, they can. But let the operator decide what the best scenario is based on the demand that they're seeing on their network. So one gigahertz wideband, that's mainly for the capacity aspects. Generating two gig ethernet throughput on a 90 degree sector. And then really kind of looking at the endpoint because that's just the coverage. Right, so the endpoint determines how much bandwidth you're providing to the base station. So starting at 100 as a minimum, right, and then scaling up to 400 megabits. Now, if you want to go beyond 400 megabits, then maybe you should be looking at millimeter wave point to point because that's when you get to higher capacities on the endpoint. But if you're trying to you know, do a shotgun coverage of your, of your area, then this could be a, a good option. And then it's got to be light and compact and discreet. So, the way it works, roughly speaking, is you have your modems, you have your multiplexer, you aggregate 40 channels. So we aggregate multiple channels to generate a one gig over the air interface. And then you have network terminating equipments that are connected pretty much just all outdoor RJ45 with a power over ethernet brick connecting to the site, the site LAN. It could be a base station, a cell site, a Wi-Fi access point, or even a company. So this is an example of, of, of the kit um, being deployed. This is a TDLTE network in the UK, the first TDLTE network in the UK. And um, essentially, this is the hub radio installed, generating a 90 degree sector. We don't have any external antennas, so the radio is all integrated with the antenna. That's one for, disc for making it discrete. Uh, and two, because Arkiva and ver uh, various sites charge not for the radio, they charge for the size of the antenna. So if you don't have an antenna, they're screwed. screwed. No, they're not that screwed because they can always change the rules, which is what they're probably going to end up doing. But at least from a selling point perspective, it makes it easier. So we don't have any antennas. But um, the, <laughs> and the end point is basically, yeah, you see that it's an RJ45 shielded connector. This is just to give you an idea of size. This is a, a ZTE, not to do any advertising, but this is a ZTE uh, 4G TDLTE base station. And this is the backhaul unit. So pretty discreet uh, in, terms of, in terms of the, uh, the, the visual aspects. Just to give you an idea of this form factor, um, I'll, pass a, I'll pass the radio around. This is actually a live, live unit, so be careful with it. Don't drop it. Um, You'll notice that there's, uh, there's two sort of antenna patterns on the, on the unit. You've got uh, what we call a sectoral sort of uh, antenna, which is the one that provides the wide area 90 degree coverage. And then you have a directional antenna, which is really at the end point, pointing back towards the hub. The reason I put both antennas in one, it's not to confuse the radio unit, but it's more to show you that it's actually the same unit that we use for the hub as we use for the NTE. That's what helps us keep the cost of production low because we're not developing separate pieces of equipment for the endpoint or the hub. You'll notice that there's two coaxial cables. That's what connects the modems and the multiplexer at the hub. And then we cap these off, and then you have an RJ45 at the endpoint, and that's what connects at the endpoint to the customer's LAN. So it's pretty small, pretty compact. You can just pass it around, and, um, and uh, please don't walk away with it. <laughs> yeah, you could. You could. So that's basically what it looks like. And we're providing currently backhaul to, to the UK's first TDLTE network uh, at 100 meg per, per site. And then uh, essentially progressively go that to 400. Um, how we do that is by uh, using our, our multiplexer. That's how we aggregate all the channels together and then connect, to the, uh, connect that to the RF connectors on the radio for the, uh, for the up conversion to 42 gig. So one of the things that comes with, with using these kinds of frequencies, though, is, is line of sight. 
You know, that's, that's typically the biggest challenge is, you know, and one of the reasons why non-line of sight solutions, um, I think I saw some Bel Air equipment outside, are popular because they're end loss and they can propagate nicely and they don't necessarily have as aggressive line of sight issues. Um, the flip side is the capacity end. And, and, and so when we're talking about trying to provide two gig, it's much harder to do that in a six gigahertz frequency than it is to do it in a 42 gig frequency. But um, the way we get around a line of sight issues is essentially we, we'll, we'll start off with a, with a 90 degree sector. We may light up three or four macro sites at a 200 meg each, right? But then we know that there's maybe some areas here that we can't yet see or they're blocked off or here where we want to extend maybe there's some new small cells coming up here that we haven't yet the reach for. So all we really do is essentially install a small relay node which is a lighter version of the radio that you're seeing here. And what that does is create another 400 megabit per second sector, narrower beam down a canyon or down another sort of area where you don't have line of sight and then provide 100 meg per cell. Uh, on each of the on, on, on each of the endpoints, so there's a way to essentially get away, get around some of the massed areas by lighting up those areas with area with with relay nodes. So in practice, just to show you how this works, this is a uh, this is Paris. If you don't recognize it, and this is where the Arc de Triomphe would be, and that's the Seine. And uh, typically, in Paris, around that area, you would have you know four macro sites. Now, for the purposes of looking forward in terms of capacity, let's assume. They're LTE advanced E node Bs, each requiring maybe around 300 to 350 megabits per second, which is not improbable in two years' time, two, three years' time. Um, so that's a total requirement of one and a half gigabits per second. What you can then do is drop a 90 degree sector in at a 1.5 kilometer range and then deliver two gig on that sector, thereby providing 350 meg per LTE A E node B. Now what happens is over time, these sites get saturated, so the operator decides to drop in a few small cells in some hotspot areas. Each of these may be requiring 50 meg. You don't need 200 meg or 300 meg per small cell because typically usage is going to be shared between 50 to 20 use, 15 to 20 users before they hand over to the next micro cell. You could scale to 100, but I think typically the number we're seeing is 50 to 100 megabits per second. So then here, what you do is, now these, these might be in areas that you don't have line of sight to from, from here, but each of these macro sites have line of sight to these small cells. So all you need to do, because they are pointing back to here, is use the bandwidth that's in the 2 gig to recirculate narrow beam sectors from the macro sites and basically extend the bandwidth to the areas that you don't have coverage for. And that, that, that allows you to then Again, very quickly, uh, from a time to market perspective, extend your coverage to these new small cells that appear. So the whole point is, when you're planning your backhaul network for your HetNet topology, create a right size area which has massive amounts of capacity that can easily be extended to new areas as and when they pop up. And then really kind of start looking at it from a way of how do I provide enough peak bandwidth as opposed to statistically provisioned bandwidth. Like, oh, there's some bandwidth here. I'm not using it here. I'm going to reallocate it here. Rather than doing that, plan for the peak because the peak is always going to come to you. Stat muxing and all these nice techniques are workarounds for, for now. But they're not a good plan for the future because you will reach that peak. So start planning from your peak from day one. And that'll help you deliver bandwidth at a low TCO, but still with a high degree of customer experience. <clears throat> Finally, this is a, a TCO model that we've done for an operator in the UK. And this is really to demonstrate you know, the comparison between point to multipoint millimeter wave and existing point to point or point to multipoint technologies. And what we're finding when we start looking especially at the total cost of ownership, this is for 40 sites delivering 200 megabits per endpoint. And we've looked at the point-to-point -point pricing that tier one operators are able to get. And that's typically around uh, two to $3,000 a link. Okay? Um, we've looked at uh, tier one point to multipoint pricing. We looked at UK spectrum fees, which are actually not that different from US spectrum fees, by the way, in terms of looking at the 38 gig. It's not that different from the UK in here. <clears throat> 
Um, and then site rental costs, which differ from country to country. I mean, you know, Cairo is $700 a month. You know, the UK is, you know, 1,500 pounds a year. I think the US is also sometimes 700, 800 US dollars a month for a site. So it's really going to depend. But, you know, we, we kind of normalize that for everyone. And then, you know, what we found out is that, you know, in a five year sort of business case, the operator for those 40, 40 links, sorry, those 20 links, 40 endpoints, um, was saving uh, 600,000 US dollars over five years just on the OPEX. And, um, you know, in terms of the cost per megabit, well, you can see the numbers. So the numbers tend to add up. If you're not just looking at the CapEx and the cost of equipment, but you're really looking at the total cost of ownership of that network, you can definitely start saving a lot of money and, and save up to 60% in OPEX fees uh, by, by going with a, with a high capacity PMP architecture. So I think to conclude is, is really that um, I think that uh, predicting demand in terms of network planning for, for what's to come is extremely difficult. It's very hard to say we're going to need 100, 200, 300 meg at these sites. Um, we know what we know now, but we don't know how behavior is going to change tomorrow. So you need to be able to plan for the future, but you don't know what the future is going to look like. So you need a lot of flexibility. Um, so you need to be able to stretch across multiple sites. You need to know that you've got high performance, good coverage, and high QoS with controllable costs. I think we all agree that head nets are here, but they'll continue to evolve and change. And, and solutions are required by operators that can easily provide gigabit coverage or multi-gigabit coverage wirelessly, not just wired. Um, and do that in a way that spreads as opposed to is focused on one single endpoint. Be able to cover multiple endpoints within one go. And integrate that you know, in a single sector, look at providing 3G, 4G backhaul, Wi-Fi backhaul, enterprise backhaul, all in one shot. Right? It doesn't need to be a specific technology per each scenario. And, and we believe, and what we're seeing with a number of our uh, customers is, is that there is a, a real cost benefit to be doing that, um, uh, especially given the current uh, growth in bandwidth that we're seeing across emerging markets and, and emerging markets together. So that's it for the first uh, presentation. I hope that I could explain a bit the, the, the subtleties in terms of the different techniques that are being used but also introduce new concepts, new ways of looking at how to backhaul uh, a heterogeneous network. So I hope you found it useful.